Hi, I think I will. I'm, I'm Pope Ward. Uh, I uh, am the Chief Research Officer for the Advisory Board for the Arts. I think I will use this guy um, and uh, walk and talk. Uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is some work that uh, has been done by our organization over the past year around the um, employment wants of um, arts professionals coming out of the pandemic. Um, a little bit of background about why my organization would have done that. So the Advisory Board for the Arts is um, a research collective for the arts. It's membership-based, um, and we do large-scale research on behalf of arts organizations um, within uh, and beyond the membership. Um, we also do uh, custom uh, work for those uh, organizations. It would be anyone from the uh, Melbourne Symphony or Hong Kong Ballet, as far flung as uh, we go about, uh, to uh, Boston Baroque, uh, as small as we go. Uh, we uh, had a meeting uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, just down the highway at uh, Canadian Opera, uh, who uh, is a member. The um, head of that organization was at uh, Houston Grand uh, Opera before, and uh, so his uh, membership came with him uh, north. Uh, the, um, each year, uh, along with the custom research work that we do on behalf of members, we uh, conduct uh, some quantitative project that is directed by that membership. Um, and it should be something that is stable across performing arts uh, organizations. So it often deals with either donors or audiences, or in this case, arts talent. Um, and uh, so the data that I will share with you is a cross region, uh, it comes from uh, multiple countries, it comes from multiple arts genres, um, but the data that we'll share is stable across those regions and genres, unless uh, I share a slide that shows some segment of that world population that has some interesting difference. Um, and I'm really glad uh, to be here and to see each of you. And uh, we have an hour together. So if uh, we don't get to something that you find interesting, I definitely find it interesting. And I'm a researcher at heart. And so I'd be very <laughs> glad to spend uh, more time with you on it. Uh, so the reason we chose doors as a theme here is because um, of the way that we conducted this study, and I'll get more into it in a minute, but it is uh, using a tool called conjoint analysis. Are people familiar with conjoint analysis? There's no reason you should be. Um, but if you were, if you were uh, in a car dealer and dragged to the side to do some market research for them, um, they might ask you to do conjoint analysis, which is this car is blue and, and gets this fuel economy and costs this much, and this other one has different attributes. Which one would you choose? And do that over and over. And so we did that, but with employment offers. Um, and uh, th there's an important reason that one would do that when you're trying to understand some what someone really wants in an employment offer that I'll get into in a moment. But that's why it's choose. What's, what's your door? Um, but uh, let me start with why we would want uh, to focus on talent this year. It's probably uh, obvious uh, to many in this room. Uh, many folks have said goodbye to their arts uh, organizations over the past uh, few years. This is someone who used a condolence card um, and then just signed their name and said, I'm giving you two weeks notice. Um, the, um, here, someone said, it's so interesting, and I'm curious to know whether this resonates uh, with you all. Um, this person said, I used to be so distraught about not following my passion. Now I am passionate about telling people how nice and tolerable my nine to five job is. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. People have felt pretty beat up you know, over the, over the past uh, three years, so it's not a um, huge surprise that you'd get some um, pretty stark uh, uh, goodbye notes. Um, the uh, data way of thinking about this is, on the one hand, um, 
uh, organizations are telling us that it is harder to fill jobs now than it was, hello, pre-pandemic. Um, uh, and, and that's uh, pretty much any job, mid-level, um, high-level job. And I mean, this is now uh, a little bit old, but we haven't heard our members talk about the statements of uh, that challenge. Um, the, there is, if you look at it from a macro perspective, a uh, challenge that is, makes this even harder, which is that nonprofits in general are experiencing a net outflow um, uh, of talent. And uh, that was a little bit of a surprise to us. You might have imagined that someone said during the pandemic, you know, I've been in the grind uh, in this corporate context for so long, um, but uh, now I'm going to go follow my passion and actually kind of nurture my soul. And um, what you are finding is that um, either the labor market is so hot that it is pulling people out of lower paying fields, um, or that people in those lower paying fields have started to feel like they have been taken for granted. Um, and so there is a, uh, a, a, a notion of um, kind of abusing the mission to get folks to do uh, things for you. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so um, this is mostly administration. Um, our members could add artists um, to the survey if they wanted. Um, there are some uh, positions that we'll look at that uh, uh, clearly have very different needs from the rest of the community. So production workers or individuals who come in and do literally day work, you know, building sets, you know, like that, that kind of thing. Um, and so organizations could put in the talent that they were most interested in understanding, but it um, is uh, heavily weighted towards administration or non-artistic jobs. Thanks for for that. Um, to compound the problem of people leaving, uh, many of our members, this is data from our own polling, have told us um, that they are trying to build new capabilities as well. I can, by the way, if you're taking pictures, I can share this after for anybody who wants. I realize that, you know, blowing up this tiny word over here is um, probably um, going to uh, be hard, but uh, I'm more than more than happy to do that. Uh, the uh, kinds of skills that organizations have named uh, uh, DEINA, uh, major gift cultivation, digital content, audience engagement. Um, there are uh, th that's interesting on the one hand. It's also a little bit scary because those are jobs that are wanted outside of our sector as well. And so now we're going to be competing with others for those capabilities that we're trying to build. There's not just an outflow of talent, it's that we need an inflow in a competitive space. Um, these are some of the jobs over here related to those that uh, folks have told us that they're trying to build um, in the next year or two. Director of People and Culture. We'll come back to that culture point because it ends up being more important uh, than some uh, believe. So, in addition to just having attraction and retention problems, there are other uh, problems that are created in organizations by these kind of tight and turbulent labor markets. One of them is um, a spike in compensation costs. Um, I, I don't know whether you all share that, but in a lot of our members, um, the um, compensation line is going way up. In part, there is an equity um, uh, reckoning going on. Uh, in part, there is inflation. And in part, um, there is the need to compete for people who uh, might go out the door. This is at a time, by the way, when we also are seeing subscription sales decline. And so our marketing costs are necessarily going up because we need to 
chase single ticket buyers, that kind of thing. And so everything is going up and up and up. And then you're saying, wow, is the only thing left to take the money out of um, the, our artistic quality? You know, like, the, so it, uh, uh, finding some way out of that doom loop is really important. And so uh, you can, you're starting to get the picture of um, why we would have wanted to find um, interesting differentiating places where you might focus on your offer that weren't all about money. Um, so in addition to the comp uh, spikes, um, we are also hearing our members talk about burnout and that maybe closes the loop with those first kind of jarring departure notes. Um, the, and uh, this, so the way to read this slide is that, whoops, hurt, um, is that the dark blue are people who are describing themselves as having a high level of burnout right now. So two thirds of department heads, uh, two thirds of senior managers, actually the, it, uh, not so much burnout in, in uh, staff at lower levels uh, in the organization, but when you're at two thirds uh, of entry level staff are at least at a medium level of burnout, you're um, in a pretty serious situation. And then there is the pandemic and the return, and there's this sense um, of a reckoning or um, a, a realignment or rebalancing of the social contract that individuals want to have with their employer. We asked a lot uh, during the pandemic of staff, you know, <laughs> kind of forget your job description uh, and uh, what we told you your role was. Um, and I don't know if you remember just like the endless scenarios, work and then rework and then rework. And then it's like, oh, by the way, we're not going to open for six months. And so we just, then we throw it all out. And so it felt like it was for naught. Um, and then after all of that, um, uh, people uh, in many organizations were sent home uh, anyway, right, after, after all that work. So then coming out of the pandemic, these are the kinds of things that we're hearing employees saying they want. We want you to walk the walk on DEI and A, uh, not just talk the talk. Um, we want uh, you to um, take a stand publicly on these things. Um, we want a bigger voice in decision making in this organization. Um, I don't know whether any of you all are familiar with the theater scene in the States, but there was a movement right after uh, the George Floyd murder called We See You White American Theater. Um, and it was an anonymous list of demands for um, half BIPOC um, artists on stage, half BIPOC artists in senior positions in organizations. So it's literally kind of 20, 25 um, demands that uh, they made and that was you know, a, a productive bomb that went off um, within that sector. Um, they also want remote work, uh, pay equity, pay transparency. We talked a little bit about that and just fewer hours. You know, they, there is a sense of burnout. So if you ask people uh, what they want coming out of the pandemic, anytime you put something on the table, the answer will be, yes, I would like some of that. I would like more money. I would like better health care. I would like um, more time off. Um, I would like a better manager, I would like, you know, and so it's very hard in the context where everything sounds good um, to get an answer that you can actually work with, you know, the, and by the way, it's always comp if you just say, we'll prioritize these things, right, you know, and so that's the one thing that we're running out of is um, more um, ability to pay with uh, straight up uh, dollars. So this is how marketing organizations handle that moment. You want the white car, uh, which is 3.6, I did it again, I'm trying to hit the, um, 3.6 liters, gets this mileage, has heated seats, and costs 21,000. Or do you want the red car? Uh, uh, it's a little more powerful, but worse mileage, and it focuses on the exterior rather than the interior. Um, and it's a little more expensive. You know, um, and so if you, choose among cars 10 times, um, the, a computer uh, can 
learn what you like um, the most and then force harder and harder trade-offs. Um, and so um, that's how car companies make your spare tire look like a yogurt lid, right? You know, that no one chooses the spare tire. Um, people that often will go for either power or fuel economy, that's um, great, but it is also hard, you know, to make a car more efficient. Um, white, not that hard, you know, the, and so if you can find places where you can really excel that are not about the money, but about some other attribute, um, that's what you're, that, that, that is um, marketing gold. And so as with uh, cars and marketing, so with talent offers, and so you can do the same thing. So these are com completely uh, made up, but um, the, I will use it to tell you a little bit more about how we did the study. So imagine you've got base pay of, um, what you would say is, imagine every other element of the job offer is just like what you have now. Um, and then you have these two new offers and they're put in front of you. One has the same pay, one has 20% increase in pay. Uh, one offers no health benefits. You have to go to a market and uh, get them. Uh, uh, and the other has uh, full. Uh, you work for an average manager versus a fantastic manager. The organization is mostly performative on DE&I uh, versus has true commitment. You get the idea. And so somebody scans down that list and it's like, ah, I could take the same pay if they were really committed to the, on the DE&I front. So I'm going to kind of go with this one. And impressionistically, they might not get it exactly right every time or that it might not be an easy trade-off. But once you do it several times, um, then uh, you can uh, figure it out. And it keeps people from having to say, I want that and I don't want that because that's just hard for people to do. Um, you just say, which would you take overall, 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 and, and um, let the algorithm do the math uh, for you. So that's what we did. And here are the 20 attributes that people could choose from. Some of them are organizational. This organization has a very high uh, uh, artistic reputation. Uh, this organization uh, is uh, transparent in information sharing. There's not information hoarding going on here, that kind of thing. It could be about the job. My schedule uh, is good. My manager's really good. You know, that's just like my role, not my organization. Um, and then uh, it could be uh, about benefits, and only some of those are the benefits that you think about. It could be you know, professional development am I invested in? Or do I have the technology that I need to do my job or do I have to do all these cra crazy workarounds, that kind of thing? Um, the way, the methodology that we used is that people could choose um, uh, six of these that would go into the trade-off analysis and then compensation was always in. Um, and that's gonna be important, we'll see in a minute or two. First of all, everyone would always choose comp anyway. But um, even if they didn't, um, it is uh, important to have compensation in there for reasons that we'll see. So just to give you a sense, um, this is how it broke out um, by uh, ballet festival uh, orchestra. So pretty evenly split amongst um, the uh, various genres. Don't worry if you're fretting and wondering whether uh, uh, orchestra is different. Um, the, we will tell you if it is different, but typically they were pretty stable. It was really interesting, and we focus on what is stable across um, genres here. Um, and the, you uh, see that uh, it is mostly U.S., but once again, I'll show you the places where Canada um, has a different uh, profile uh, in a minute. Uh, but that's, that's what the... Um, about 1,500 um, staff across arts organizations look like. I'm going fast just because I like to get to the researchy part, but um, if it please do stop me. So just to show you um, the skyline here, this is what uh, people care about. So, and relative to each other, that's one of the amazing things about conjoin is like, nope, it's all the salary. Everything else just matters this tiny amount. I realize that these are microscopic. And so I'll just, I'll go down the line for you in case you can't see. 
But so base salary, um, forget the scale, it is literally U tiles. Um, but the, what matters is relatively how much things um, uh, matter compared to other things. So I had to break the page. So up at 25, twice, more than twice the height of uh, any other bar is base salary. It always is. Um, and then uh, right behind that is uh, health benefits, obviously, in places where they are provided. That is uh, not the same in that bar size would spread out almost evenly amongst these other categories. Um, the manager quality uh, comes in third. That is also very similar in a uh, corporate context. Uh, there's an old adage, you know, people don't leave companies, they leave their manager, right? Uh, the, and that's the case here too. Um, job security, job flexibility, artistic reputation, DE&I commitment. We'll come back to those two in a minute. It's really uh, important to see how um, that varies amongst groups. Um, and not much else was important to see whether it varies amongst groups, just um, FYI. Um, but it is interesting to see organizational transparency, room for advancement, work from home. So down here, pretty, pretty low, right? You know, the, but we'll see that in um, it cut a different way, it uh, matters uh, more. Um, the it, um, one one clue to that, um, if everyone is the same, differences on the seventh attribute really matter, right? You know, like in other words, if I can't really, if I if I'm looking over at another organization that I might go to, and everything looks pretty much identical to the way it looks here, then look to the places it doesn't, right? Um, by the way, here were the so. So th this scale, right, 5, 10, 25, and the Canadian difference is 0.38 on org recognition. Um, they care, you uh, care about it more. Manager quality, a little bit more. Room for advancement, a little bit less. But those were the big ones, and they are in decimal point uh, levels. So um, the, it was um, not um, big differences. So there, it is one thing to say, what do I value? What is important and how much more or less than other things? And then this uh, slide tells us what they have got. So here's how I would assess my organization on healthcare or manager quality or job security or flexible work. Um, and so um, the, um, this was the scale that people could uh, choose from. And it is worth noting just to that point um, I touched on before um, that uh, if you're already doing great, you may not be able to get much juice from the squeeze if you try to improve it. And so these areas in red, manager quality, job security, uh, and artistic reputation, orgs already believe that, uh, sorry, staff already believe that their organizations are at the highest level. At least half of them do here, 72% of them here. And again, half of them uh, here roughly think they're already at the highest levels, meaning they're way over at the third, right? So job security, I don't really have job security. I've got some, I've got a ton of job security, 72%. Um, the, whereas the organization's transparency, it's like, hmm, we do okay. You know, it's not, it's not great. That's what two-thirds, roughly, of the folks um, would say. It's, it's useful to um, understand um, what people want and what they believe they've got when you're trying to make hard trade-offs yourself around where to invest to improve when you have scarce resources. So, um, the, I'm about to... I'm a, a, I have a personal rule, which is that you're allowed one visual mugging per presentation, which means the slide is incomprehensible. And so this is literally a slide that is to prepare you for the visual mugging on the next slide. So um, there, are th there are three things that I need to tell you in order to interpret the next page. Um, one is uh, that conjoint uh, makes it possible not only to see that skyline that we saw, I value this, I value this a little bit less, this a little bit less, but what if we were to make improvements? If I were to go from here 
to here, what is that worth to you? It's kind of like, think about it, um, if you were, if you'd, let's imagine we all wanted Big Macs. Um, the, if you had one Big Mac, you, that might give you a certain amount of value. The second Big Mac, it kind of diminishes a pretty good bit. By the time you're to your 11th Big Mac, it's like, it's probably going down again, negative, right? You know, and same thing with anything, you know, think your vacation days. It's like, my 73rd vacation day is less valuable to me because A, I think I'm never going to get to it. But B, you know, I'm probably decompressed by day 53, right? Um, and so that, that, so you can actually tell how much the next increment of improvement is worth to someone. Um, so that's thing one. Um, thing two, um, because we put compensation into every job offer, uh, it is possible to turn the, those values into financial values. It's the equivalent of trading off this amount of salary in order to get more manager quality or professional development or whatever it might be. Um, so that's the second thing. Um, the third is you can think about each attribute, in, like uh, can I work from home a lot, some or none, you know, on its own, but it's useful to think about them in clusters for two reasons. One is that you likely work on things together. Um, work from home and flex hours, you know, are likely going to be in job flexibility. You know, um, it is also likely to be the way that you talk about it to outsiders. Uh, and we'll get into that more because the more you get into intangibles like culture, um, and that's what you want to differentiate on, that's hard to talk about unless you really think hard about it. And it's a, if, if I would leave you with um, one lesson today, you'll see on this visual mugging, think hard about it um, uh, because uh, it matters. Um, and so um, those three things should prepare you for this visual mugging, which I will, uh, I will blow up the, the, the big pie in just a second. But um, what this, pie, the, this uh, chart is, um, is uh, a measurement of improvement of different elements of the job offer from where folks are on average to really good. So the single biggest dollar improvement that you could make um, is by going from okay to really good on this $2,800 pie. These are American dollars, um, but it doesn't really matter because again, it's more relative, but I'll tell you how we, how we calculated the, the dollar amount. So that blue pie is job schedule, flexibility, and hours. Right? So if you, you want to go from okay to really good on job flexibility and hours, um, the, and by the way, really good is essentially, as long as I get my work done, let me work when I need to work. You know? um, the, um, then that would be the um, biggest move that you could make. Um, the uh, biggest pie here, uh, is inclusive culture. Um, and uh, in a second, I'm going to show you what these dimensions are on, on its own page. Um, and I'll tell you why we clustered the elements that we did in inclusive culture together. But it was a surprise to us that those things mattered um, in the way that they did. Um, the, um, but uh, it's also interesting uh, what doesn't matter, and we've hinted at why. Um, artistic reputation and community impact, or it's like kind of what is our face to the community, either in terms of the non-artistic education work, that kind of thing that we do, or um, the actual reputation that we have in the community. Um, uh, part of it is that everyone already thought they were good, right? You know, and so the movement doesn't get you um, much. Um, there is another... Uh, a reason that we'll see that's embedded in um, differences among groups um, in, in just a second. Um, but let me share um, this inclusive culture pie with you. So the elements of uh, an inclusive culture are 
you know, is the organization transparent? Are people hoarding or not? You know, like the um, is that kind of a way that people maintain the hierarchy? You know, um, is or um, do we all know um, what the big issues are and have the information we need to do our jobs? Um, organizational commitment to DEI and A. This gets back to that performative versus actual um, real uh, progress on that dimension. Uh, an inclusive decision-making um, culture. Um, the, am, am I involved in even high stakes decisions that are taking place in this organization? Or am I a uh, you know, chess piece to be moved? Um, then job accountability seems kind of funny. Um, and there is a reason that it is in here, um, which is um, that uh, something that we found um, as we did the qualitative side of this research, which is when you start making improvements on these three other dimensions, the thing that unravels is accountability. Um, because it's like, sure, you know, is, okay, so is this a vote now? You know, about what our next season is going to include? Um, the, the, or do the people who are, you know, our paid artistic director um, uh, making decisions um, about the season, the, um, it is not a vote, but when you allow more participation, um, who actually has the ball on the decision can get lost or harder um, to understand. And so organizations um, that are able to do these things and maintain accountability um, within the organization uh, uh, have a uh, real advantage over other organizations. Um, even when you're not doing these other things, job accountability really matters in terms of, it's like, do the people um, who uh, 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 are clearly the most competent get more work, and then the ones who um, aren't get less work? You know, like that, that, that can be an element of job accountability too, sure. That is the right way to think about it. So, so the question uh, was, <laughs> what are these numbers, which I should have explained, but it's basically um, the, it is how much comp would I trade off in order to get the improvement from um, average to really good on that dimension? And so, but then what, but, but what does everyone really put only 1,676? American dollars on org transparency? No, this is for employee MIC average, um, which was uh, about fifty-five to sixty thousand um, dollars. Was if you just said what is the average salary for all people who took the survey, and so this is the average uh, amount that you would trade off for that average employee if we treated that all as kind of one big person. Um, sure. You can think of it in both ways, but the, importantly, the second way is just as legitimate because what they were saying, that what they are mentally saying is, I would like more of those things than I am getting, and therefore, uh, if if those things were to improve, that would be a more attractive offer to me, you know. And if those things were to improve, I you could take the foot off the gas a little bit on the salary for me. Great uh, questions. Thanks for both of them because they're important. So here is the one place where there was a really interesting. Difference. So these are the same orders that you saw before. You know, it's like healthcare, manager quality, job security, job uh, flexibility, and then you get to this one place. And they're and they're these are so uh, to interpret this. The orange over or what is that deep orange um, is Gen Z, the youngest people in the workforce. The dark blue, um, your baby boomers, your oldest employees. Um, the, I have made them fat so that you can see them, but the heights are accurate. 
you know, to the rest of the graphic. Um, and so um, what this is telling us is that the older you are, the more uh, you trade off to get artistic reputation uh, of your organization. Um, the younger you are, um, the more important you find org commitment to DEI and A. Um, and so it is um, the, at, its, at its most dramatic, kind of a uh, generational clash on what good the organization provides in the community. So is our gift to the community this art form? Or is there some progress we help the community to make through this art form, right? Do we actually um, uh, help uh, with change um, the community wants to make? So for example, a way of thinking about that, we were um, working with a theater in San Diego, and we said, like, the, it's like, is just saying, well, we provide really high-end theater, in San Diego, is that's benefit enough, right? You know, that's part of culture. Um, and what they said is, the we're we are trying to get to a crystal clear articulation of what the benefit to the community of really great theater is, and particularly ours versus fill in blank theater, right? You know, like that. Why should we be here rather than why should theater um, be here? Um, and for them, the answer is. Um, because um, w what we do in our community work and on stage is strengthening the empathy muscle of this community. And communities are stronger when the, their inhabitants have stronger empathy in general and for and with each other. Um, so that's the, the and, and clearly um, there has been a social reckoning uh, around DEI and A uh, issues and um, that is um, coming out um, loud and clear in these findings. I did want to point out before we go on to kind of blow out the big pie, the inclusive culture um, pie, uh, that there is one other place um, where uh, we see uh, big um, differences in what people care about, and it's just a healthy reminder. This is um, the, uh, what the C-suite of our organizations uh, care about versus people who aren't in the C-suite. So um, the C-suite, uh, partially because of age and partially because they probably spent their whole careers on this. Sorry, the, uh, the, the executive team of the uh, organization, sure. Thank you, of course, that what is the C-suite? Um, that, or um, make sure we've defined that. So think of this as the executive team uh, for the organization, the, the head, the people who run um, the departments. Um, and so they tend to really want accountability, not a surprise. Uh, they, they have uh, high standards for management uh, in the organization. Um, and they want organizational transparency. Interesting, the kinds of things that they trade away because probably they don't have them are things like job flexibility um, and ability to work from home. If you're never doing it, then you would happily. Yeah, they are not saying, by the way, that no one should have those things. They're saying, I'm willing to trade those things away for other things in my life because of how, in the same way that production would also trade away um, the ability to work from home, right? Because there is no sense in which that is likely to happen. Um, so it, this is just a healthy reminder. In business school, there's a um, case that where it's often asked, um, you know, what percent of you of you have a can of chili um, in your pantry? And uh, right, so anybody, it's one. Two, right? So that's that's about the business school average too. Um, Seventy-five percent of America, chili, right? So the point here is, um, this you are not the audience, you know, 
And so don't think, you know what I want, that's pretty much what this organization wants um, if, if you're in the C-suite, right? You know, like the, they want chili. We did not ask that. So we don't, like, all we, all we said is, what do you want? Um, and so we didn't say, what do you think, what would you guess the rest of your folks want? And, and do you, what would you, what would you um, guess they would say the current uh, level of our performance is, is another good one, which people get wrong. We've done that in other formats. Right, do you do the question? <laughs> So I, it feels like I turn into a robot when I do that. But yes, I will repeat uh, the question. The question was, um, do, uh, uh, do people, um, did we test in any way um, uh, whether people had a good sense of what other people want in the organization? We did not test that. Um, if you do nothing else based on what we've learned so far, um, I have a small piece of advice for you, which is to go to your job sites um, at your uh, organization and just take a look. Um, because um, what your uh, job site should be projecting is why someone should come to you and not somewhere else, right? And so artistic excellence is by far the biggest thing that we see on job sites. You should know we are fantastic at what we do, and it's true, and they should know that, but it is not luring people in the arts to you because they believe that they've already got that um, where they are, and they would not trade that much to get more of it, right? And so if you're thinking about, um, what you want to put on your job site, think about what might differentiate you um, in the job um, market. So some people talk about benefits. That is also very high, but if they don't perceive a lot of difference in the benefits that organizations provide, or they already feel pretty good where they are, then it's going to be hard to get somebody to overcome their switching costs and come to you unless you want to pull the lever that is so hard and increasingly hard for us to pull, which is compensation, right? I can bribe. By the way, people are very bribable in the arts. It's a, they're pretty sensitive to salary. Um, so um, that works. The problem is all boats are rising on salary with inflation and the other reasons that we talked about before. And so then you have to, you have to go on top of that, right? Um, so that, that I, would, I would recommend that. Um, the, this can get scary when you start thinking about what people care about where you could differentiate things like an inclusive culture. How do I talk about that? You know, um, and uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Are there tangible instances that I can use as um, centerpiece explanations of our culture, which are, and organizations um, talk about it, but it's, but put yourself in the seat of a candidate. It's like, you know what, we've got a really inclusive culture, says you, you know, like the, and so I could go uh, and interview a bunch of your staff, but who does that, right? You know, and so how do you get to that if that's a thing that you want people to choose you on relative to others? Um, so let's talk about that inclusive culture bit. Um, when we got that finding, the big pie, um, and we knew that movement, improvement on that um, is something that people really valued, um, we uh, went deep into the academic and the corporate research on what is actually meant by an inclusive culture. And we went um, uh, deep, deep. And... Uh, then we tried to simplify. And so what you see on this page is a simplification. Um, I should give a shout out um, at the end of the presentation, which I am um, happy to share. I put in the appendix something called the Netter Principles. There's a Cornell Labor Conference sponsored by the Netter Foundation years ago um, that 
included a set of principles around what an inclusive organization was. Um, we then mashed those up with the other um, research that we've been doing and conversations with dozens of arts organizations and turned um, inclusive culture into this. Um, you can think of it either as a you know, taxonomy or um, a path uh, of advancement over time. Um, but I find it easiest to talk about what I mean by section by thinking how an individual in the organization would feel at each stage. And I boxed those um, there at the top. So broadly, there are three um, big categories. There is identity is part of an inclusive culture. Um, it's okay for me to be me um, here, whatever that is. Um, voice, um, I, everyone's got a voice, but am I empowered to use my voice here? Um, or do I, do I get smacked down directly or subtly or um, indirectly if I do? And then finally, in kind of um, the furthest right manifestation of an inclusive culture is power. Um, who has it, right? Do I really have a role in even big decisions that are being made in this organization or not? Um, and uh, that obviously can be on a scale. I have some, but not all. Or um, the, um, but when um, an organization has taken steps to bring people into big um, decisions um, that isn't entirely based around its hierarchy, um, then uh, that is an organization that is playing in the power part of an inclusive organization. So let me just walk through them in terms of feeling. You know. Um, uh, uh, welcoming someone, um, it's like you are, it is okay for you to be here is a pretty low bar. Think about it as there is, there is nothing in our, the bylaws of our country club that says you may not be in this group it is a pretty low bar, but that's inclusion, you know, like you're, you can be included here. Belonging is different. It implies some sense of, um, uh, values you know they they get me and i want to be part of this because we share a belief system so you you regard yourself as belonging uh to the boy scouts because not because you got patches but because there's kind of a system of belief that you think also describes you um so that's the identity um element of it um, the voice elements, like, do I feel connected to this organization? Remember we were talking about the transparency of information? Do, um, is information hoarded in this organization? Um, or are we all siloed and um, people regard that as a way to maintain their own power and jobs is to kind of um, uh, keep uh, information to themselves? Um, Opportunity is another part of that. Do I feel valued? If this organization is looking for developmental opportunities for me, they're investing in me. Um, and that, uh, is that, that makes me feel um, valued. Um, and then finally, um, the, uh, in the power uh, section here, um, I feel invested in this organization. This is when um, I feel as though um, I influence what goes on in this organization, not just in my sliver of this organization. Um, so uh, we won't have time today to talk uh, about a case from Stages, uh, which is a Houston theater that essentially for many decisions that the organization makes, allows anyone who wants to be part of it to um, volunteer to be on a team boldly. That includes um, script selection for the coming year. It also, um, they have collectively rebuilt um, their hiring process to be more inclusive with a cross-organizational team of people who wanted to be part of it. Um, the, um, it could be almost anything, a new HR policy. If you wanna be in on it, you can be. 
Um, and then they have some rules of engagement for who's ultimately accountable um, and how decision making will take place on that team. Um, the, and then finally, um, this, uh, we struggled with the word here in this last category, and we finally came up with an es essential because um, that was the point in the power dynamic where it's not just am I allowed to have a voice uh, in decisions, but the organization has decided that it, will, it needs me in order to make better decisions. So that in that stages example, where they, um, uh, they, they have about 40 people in their organization, 17 to 20 are on the script selection team, right? You know, the, they want a role in what's going to be in next season. Um, that's remarkable. Um, and um, the, I spoke to the artistic director there, and I said, would you do it again? Would you open it up? Or know, unleashed um, Pandora's box. And he said, when you have these impassioned people who know your city um, and you have given them guidance around what makes for a good season and um, it helps you articulate what really does make for a great season, what differentiates us as an organization and then I, as the artistic director, have to at least be able to defend my decisions um, uh, in a group of people who care about the fate of this organization. So it only makes it stronger. And then I get a whole room full of advocates to go out into the company and the world um, with the decision that's ultimately made. So um, the, that, that's what we mean by essential. It's like, it's not only do I get to be part of it if I want to, the organization makes better decisions because of me. Um, so that's um, the overall um, rubric um, that we developed, and I'm sure uh, it will evolve over time, but it's uh, 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 been pretty stable and people have valued it as an explanatory device um, internally. Um, below are some of the actual activities that would go on that we have heard from arts organizations in each of those areas. And so um, that's one thing in the abstract, but then uh, we knew that we needed to go out into the, where are we on time, by the way? I don't, you'd think that I would. Uh... Okay, great. So we've got, but well, we've got five minutes, maybe a little more. Great. So um, the, uh, should have asked that before. I'm, I'm glad that it isn't negative seven minutes. Um, the, um, what we went uh, out into the world to do was to find examples of organizations who were playing um, in each of these spaces. And so uh, the one that we'll spend a few minutes on is the McCarter uh, Theater. They are the theater that is on the campus of Princeton University. They are associated with Princeton, but they are not owned um, by Princeton. They do a lot of work together um, and have combined leadership in many ways um, that we'll, we'll talk about their user guides and I'll be interested to know whether any of you um, have experimented with anything similar when we look at them. Um, uh, uh, we won't uh, go into, but I would be happy to share um, the LA Phil's um, work on portfolio uh, succession planning I mentioned that people feel invested in if the organization is actively thinking about opportunities that would expand and develop them. Um, the, uh, and you can imagine, that's a, like, that is a higher state of inclusion. They are looking for other ways to include me in ways that make me better. Um, and the LA Phil does this in a systematic way, in part because they, they were done with chasing people out the door. Right, and they said, we've got a certain amount of opportunities. We know who our talent is. Let's look at them and think about what opportunities we have as an organization every six months and think about whether we can go to those individuals proactively um, and uh, offer those opportunities. And it is way less expensive to go to somebody with an opportunity than to chase them out the door begging, right? You know, the, and so um, they have found that it has created more stability in the organization
because they're approaching people and saying, what about this? You know, and, and that makes somebody feel included. Um, and then finally, the organization that I was talking about uh, that uh, has created these rules of engagement around power sharing is um, stages. They have literally a template um, that they use as a charter launch document for every team that comes together cross-functionally in order to get something done so they know who has what roles and who is ultimately accountable, those kinds of things, and how it uh, advances the organization's values. Um, the, uh, I will tell you, um, because we mentioned it before when we were talking about the career sites, um, that very small, tangible things um, can have big impacts on your culture. And I just want to um, lightly touch on one of my favorite books that sounds so boring. If you have read it, um, tell other people that you like it too. It's called The Checklist Manifesto. See, I told you it's super boring. Um, the, um, it is by a guy who made a checklist for surgery theaters um, around the world. The most sophisticated Mayo Clinic surgery theater, uh, the uh, one in the most distant field hospital. Um, the, it has uh, roughly 15 checklists. One is when the, uh, you're about to do anesthesia, one is when you're about to do the cut, and one is when you're about to leave. It's literally, do we count all the instruments? Isn't that gross? Um, but, uh, but when you do those things, then um, mortality rates go way down. Uh, and uh, uh, infection rates go way down, even though everyone knows to do these things, they are being reminded to, and they're forced to go through the checklist. There is one item in that checklist. Um, confirm that all team members have introduced themselves by name and role. Sounds like such a, a tiny thing, but what happens when you do that is people feel empowered to do their role, and... Uh, uh, I'm sure if you have a surgeon in your life, it's totally not like this, but surgeons have a reputation for being surgeon as God in the operating theater and what they say goes, and it's not a team, it's a surgeon and minions, right? And um, so this is post-checklist uh, in Jordan, um, and uh, a uh, operating theater that would have defined exactly what I was talking about generally based on the culture. Um, this is, the surgeon goes up to those comically large lights and adjusts them with his glove on. The nurse says, doctor, you have to change your glove. You touched an unsterile service. Um, he said, it's, it's fine. No, it's not. Don't be stupid. Right? Never would have happened before that simple element of a surgery checklist. Now, uh, think about um, how to turn culture into something you could talk about with a candidate. Right? These little things matter. So this is um, what the McCarter uh, Theater did. Um, they, uh, as I mentioned, are uh, the uh, Princeton University campus uh, theater. Um, they created um, user guides. And user guides, um, the, somebody on uh, their production staff said, I had so many new people, and coming out of the pandemic, even the people who I'd worked with for years, I felt like I was reintroducing myself to them. Like, everyone has a different relationship with work now. Um, and so I wanted to kind of open myself up and tell them what my relationship with work was. And these user guides are essentially an operating manual that you write about yourself, about how to use you at work. Um, and so um, the, this is the actual uh, template, um, the, but I have arrayed um, the elements of the template on uh, this arrow from things that are just fact-based. Um, I drop my kids off at school. I am not available until, until nine because I am in a car, right? You know. Um, to preferences, um, I really prefer um, email communications. Texts are intrusive. I want to be done when I want to be done, and a text can kind of penetrate the veil because it is also my um, personal life. Um, through to motivations, like the, literally these are things they ask. What are aspects of your work that excite you or bring joy and satisfaction? You know, the, 
Um, not every organization would want to do that, and not every individual would want to do that, and that's okay. Um, in fact, we have one organization that saw this and said, "This is there is no chance that our organization would implement this. It just it feels like too much for us, but we can do it for, we're, we're going to make user guides for Slack. Um, I don't know, what do, do you all use Slack as just communication um, tool? They, and, and so they said, um, how, uh, uh, how, what, what is okay uh, use of Slack? And they came to some very different rules um, for how they work with each other on that front. Um, what the McCarter Theater would say is that the more vulnerable that especially managers are on these user guides, the more effective they are as a team bonding tool and just a team engagement tool. Um, they write them for individual productions. So let's say there was one that had a sexual touch, right? Something that would go uh, into the user guide might be um, what are the what's okay and not, you know, um, in this production. And they they have found that um, when they have conflict and people have written these user guides, they will literally get people to read each other's user guides who haven't worked with each other before. And it often will kind of de-escalate um, a situation. Um, so that's the user guide. Um, the I, I won't go deeply into the role out except to say that no one ever has time to do these or to read each other's, right? Because we just all have day jobs. Um, one of the things that McCarter has done that I thought was genius is they have created McCarter days, which are full days that the organization does, uh, uh, sets aside each quarter to do the things that they never get to do, right? You know, and so it might be clean out my files, um, but they'll name things for part of the day that we all need to do as an organization and that we none of us have made time for. Um, and so that was what happened in August uh, 22 for uh, the first McCarter Day was complete this for yourself to the extent that you want to, and then let's share them with our teams. But many of our members have seen um, these guides since and adapted them or taken some small corner of the Slack example that I gave um, and uh, think about um, your ability to have a conversation about your culture with a candidate. It's like, oh, and one of the things that we do are these user guides. Here's the table of contents, um, and uh, uh, here's how we use them internally to strengthen our teams. That then becomes kind of a moment of tangibility that feels um, very checklist manifesto. Um, I'm going to leave it there and um, simply offer my thanks for being able to spend uh, some time with you. I'm happy to take questions, but I understand that you all have a... Um, uh... Okay, great. So if, if folks have questions or thoughts or comments on any of this, I'm most happy to entertain them.